actually, after the last uh, two presentations, I think I can say that I am the bearer of hopeful news. If not exactly good news, but hopeful news. <laughs> okay, um, so I am going to give a quick history and overview of AB 32, uh, then a, a quick survey of the legislation. Lori is going to be talking about cap and trade, which is a piece of AB 32. And um, she's going to explain how it works and what the problems are with it. And then I'm going to be talking about the implications for fee and dividend. And we should have time for questions at the end if all goes according to plan. So AB 32 is California's Global Warming Solutions Act. It was uh, enacted in 2006 with the goal of returning California to 80% of 1990 levels by 2020. And it was originally an outgrowth of an executive order by then Governor Schwarzenegger that set California's emissions goals. And in addition to setting the short-term 2020 goal, it also set a goal, a long-term goal uh, for 2050, which was 20% of 1990 levels. And when Governor Brown came into office, he went further and he has set his goal for 2050 as a complete decarbonization of California. <laughs> so since AB 32 was put in place and, and especially since Jerry's been in office, um, it's been continuously strengthened and expanded. Um, the, we are on track to meet the 2020 goal, but to achieve the 2050 goal, we ha uh, emissions have to decline several times faster than they currently are. But the ongoing enactment of uh, further legislation is meant to address this, and in total, the state has enacted over 70 pieces of legislation to reduce emissions all across economic se sectors. And I, I hope, by the end of my survey of the legislation, that you will see that this suite of bills really amounts to comprehensive policymaking. It amounts to um, policymaking that's coordinated across all state agencies. And it includes uh, targeted investment and strategic market support for advanced technologies. So two things to keep in mind as I go through the legislation. Brown wants climate to be a major part of his legacy. AB 32 is being designed uh, as a model for federal legislation and not only in the US. They're looking for solutions that can be put in place across the globe. The other thing is that the cap and trade program which is the problematic piece of AB 32, provides 25% of the funding needed for this legislation. It's projected that AB 32 will provide 30 billion out of the projected 120 billion needed over the next six years. So, Noel, what does that mean exactly? Providing the funding? Yeah, what project? AB 32, uh, I'm sorry, cap and trade provides AB 32, 30% uh, of it, 25, 25 percent of the funding for AB 32 legislation for the complete uh, package of legislation is provided by proceeds from cap and trade. Well, you'll see. Well, just wait. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I guess I haven't explained this well, but you will see in a minute. So, um, AB 32 uh, and companion legislation is designed to reduce emissions across all economic sectors. These are the sectors, you don't have the sectors that the state is working with. Sorry, I'm looking, I have two different screens here and I'm looking at the wrong one, obviously. Um, I'm going to briefly discuss the first three of these, and I have just selected a few examples from each, each sector to give you an, uh, an idea of the variety 
of approaches being implemented to reduce emissions. So, energy is the first one. There's 50% uh, of the state's greenhouse gases, gas emissions are associated with the energy sector. There, and, uh, these, some of the uh, provisions that they are putting in place to reduce this are efficiency measures. The state this year is making a big press on efficiency. Um, and actually efficiency regulations have been in place in California for four decades, so these are just building on them. Here's just a few. Uh, they have new standards for household appliances and electronics, and more are coming. They have uh, building efficiency standards for all new construction. They have uh, improvements in energy efficiency as well as clean energy projects in all state-owned buildings, which also includes all the public schools and community colleges. On the investment and market support side, um, there is the renewables portfolio standard, and this is the provision that provides investment in the development of renewables and incentives for getting them to market. And it mandates uh, that renewables comprise 33% of California's energy by 2020. And we are on track for that. And um, there's just been a bill introduced in January called SB 350, which will mandate 50% of renewables by 2030. Also, the state is investing in storage technology for renewables. That is the big problem with renewables, is how to store it. And uh, they're looking at improving and expanding the use of combined heat and power systems. And this is where waste heat is used to generate power in factories and institutions that require both electricity and steam. Um, cap and trade should also reduce emissions slightly from the energy sector. Lori will talk about that. Um, and just to give you an idea of the complexity of energy issues, uh, the electricity grid right now, fossils take priority. It does not have the flexibility to handle uh, a large proportion of renewables and especially not a large proportion of uh, different renewables. So they have to develop the technology to do that. They have to pass legislation to change the grid so that it can accommodate renewables. Okay, on to the transportation sector. Um, the transportation sector accounts for 26% of our emissions. Sorry, sorry, 36% of our emissions. And as with the energy sector, there is an existing framework of regulations that these new regulations build on. With respect to vehicles, there's mileage standards for cars and zero emission vehicle regulations. And these mandate one and a half million electric cars by 2025. And those are things we all know about, but in, in addition to those things, they're looking at some interesting improvements in things like tires and motor oil. And they're also looking at vehicle apps for avoiding congestion that should be built in in cars and adaptive cruise control and stuff like that, which they say can reduce emissions by 10%. There's also the low carbon fuel standard which encourages investment in low carbon transportation fuels. And that legislation required carbon content to be reduced 10% by 2020. But SB 350, when it passes, will mandate 50% by 2030. Um, they're also looking at ways of uh, improving what they call system efficiencies. And um, that's improvements to roadways to reduce traffic using um, GPS to control traffic lights to avoid and reduce congestion 
and also things like paving systems. Apparently, who knew? Our paving systems are not efficient. So they're looking at that. Another uh, approach that they're using is they're using urban planning and land use regulations to reduce travel demands and provide more op uh, transportation options. This year, cap and trade comes under, uh, sorry, transportation fuels come under cap and trade. So that might or might not reduce emissions. And lastly, the bullet train. The bullet train turns out as a critical piece of this. The bullet train will be fueled entirely by renewables. And so it will not only take all of those cars off the road, but this is also the, apparently this is the biggest short haul airline route in the country. So saving all that air travel will have big consequences for emissions as well. Okay, next is the agriculture se sector, um, which Paul Muller gave a nice introduction to. Um, this accounts for 8% of the emissions in the state, which isn't a lot, but uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture include the short-lived pollutants, methane and black carbon, and those are very potent. So, and, and agriculture is complicated because, first of all, the regulations will overlap with water use because water transport is, as Paul said, a significant energy use we do use 19% uh, of the electricity and 30% of the natural gas in the state to move the water. And ag accounts for 80% of that. So um, that's one reason. Another reason it's complicated is because obviously there's a wide variety of sizes of farms and a wide variety of crops and animals grown. So there aren't very many one-size-fits-all solutions. And another reason it's complicated is because we haven't really done the research. Uh, and we haven't done enough research and enough development on advanced irrigation and fertiliza fertilization technologies. So the state has yet to implement any of these, but this is what they are working on to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. They are working on improved fertilization methods to reduce the release of nitrous oxide. Um, they're looking at more efficient irrigation, including advanced technology, and this can also reduce the amount of fertilization needed. They're looking at manure management, and they're working on increasing the sequestration of carbon through reduced tillage and better crop management. And those two things would also lower emissions by lowering fuel requirements. Um, and Paul mentioned the biogas, so they're also working on that. All of that is going to require research and technical assistance and financial incentives from the state for the farmers to adopt them. Okay, how are we on time? Okay, I'm going to turn this over now to Lori, who will talk to you about cap and trade. for a carbon fee and dividend can complement all that California is doing, which is certainly very impressive. Um, and basically how both the cap and trade with offset mechanism and carbon fees with dividend can coexist in California. Um, I have had the honor of working with Mark and Marshall since very early on. Um, my husband and I um, have and remain longtime employees of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, where we are attorneys. 
but this talk that I'm giving and all of my work with Mark Marshall is my personal capacity, and I'm expressing my personal opinions only here today. Um, uh, so three pillars of all environmental law, as we've started to discuss, are regulation, basically command and control. We tell people what to do. These energy efficiency requirements are required. Public investment, when we take our tax money, and we say we're going to build public transportation or fund research and development, and market mechanisms, which are where we create the incentives that shift what people do day to day, where every business, every person, every investor considers the consequence of better rules of the road. And in climate, we had two competing approaches, cap and trade with offsets and carbon fees with dividends. So that's what I'm going to be explaining a little bit more about right now. Um, this chart has changed a little bit. I haven't really uh, changed my slide, however. So we have that uncontrolled fossil fuels are cheaper and more available than our cleaner energy alternatives. Industrial solar, rooftop solar, geothermal, and wind are all um, you know, among the technologies that may help us. But in addition to that, there's um, conservation and energy efficiency are other powerful mechanisms that can get us where we need to go. And so the question is how to shift things dramatically from where we are today with massive use of uncontrolled fossil fuels to a cleaner energy future. So the goal of a market mechanism, as I mentioned, is to fix the incentives for households, businesses, and investors. The goal is to increase incentives for conservation, energy efficiency, and clean energy investment. So what's cap and trade? A lot of people continue to be confused about this. It's very confusing. I've explained this to my relatives over and over again. Many of them still don't get it. Um, uh, even my kids who are like very enthusiastic, but you're doing a good thing, mom. No, it's like, uh, okay, so the cap. The cap is a limit that we set on a group of um, a sectors, perhaps, and we ask that every year that cap go down so we have less and less of the pollutant until we reach the environmental goal. As you may recall, this was something that was applied to uh, acid rain, it was reasonably successful there, but that's because that was a lot easier challenge than this. What is trade? A trade is when one of our little blue factories has an easier time making reductions than one of our big red factories. And so basically, our red factory buys permits to pollute from the little blue factory who may have a surplus. What are offsets? Offsets, again, I could teach a semester class on this, but I'm not going to right now. Um, offsets are the idea that outside the cap sectors, you try and make reductions in other sectors, such as agriculture, so, or forestry, um, or chemical production. And so idea, in this diagram, which um, uh, basically the cap sector is shown in the yellow, uh, reductions are shown in black and the uncapped sector is shown in green. So what we're saying is, in the first, very first diagram to the left, we have what we would have if there were no offsets in the system. We would look at fossil fuels, the capped sector, and we would simply reduce them. In an offset system, like we have today in California under cap and trade, 85% of all reductions can be offsets outside the fossil fuel sector. So what we have there is, if offsets actually represent emission reductions that would not have happened anyway, if they are truly additional, what you would have is you would have those 85% of reductions not happening in the fossil fuel sector. The fossil fuel sector gets to stay high. But in the offset sector, you would have the compensating emission reductions. But what happens if offsets are not truly additional? You pretend that you're getting reductions in other sectors, your fossil fuels remain above the cap, and guess what? You have a false accounting progress. So here's an example of a carbon offset problem. We pay people to preserve their forests. Guess what? They were, well, they burn, that's one possibility. Or they were planning to preserve that particular forest anyway. And you, the uh, forest owner, perhaps, you know, gets a bonus for what you would have done anyway. But guess what? Demand for wood does not go away, and a different forest is cut somewhere in the world to supply that. That's one example of why offsets fail. So, quick summary. 
Why cap and trade with offsets fails to fix incentives? Basically, they result, especially because of the offsets, but also because of the nature of cap and trade in a very low price on polluting. Two, the price is volatile. It's uncertain. It does not lead to investment or big changes in behavior. Three, offsets in general, where even though I can't explain to you why it's true today, are generally unverifiable and create an illusion of progress. It is not a, a valid mechanism, in my opinion, my personal opinion. Um, and AB 32, for instance, currently has a very low, amounts to essentially a very low carbon tax at 12, approximately $12 per ton. Um, so what are, getting back to what we're trying to do here and how it's going to work together, there are two elements, critical elements of the real solution. Clean energy must be cost competitive with fossil fuel energy within a known time frame. And the energy that people need remains affordable for everyone during that transition. So as you know, our plan is at TCL to phase in carbon fees in a predictable pattern so people know what's going to happen. We also plan to give the money back in monthly per person rebates so that everyone can afford the energy they need. And Low-income households are protected, but there's also this huge democratic element of we all get an equal rebate or dividend. What does this do? This shifts investment. As soon as we pass our bill at the federal <coughs> level, there'll be a huge shift in what our energy companies do today. They will no longer invest in the tar sands. They will invest in clean energy. So, um, basically, how does carbon fee and dividend fix the incentives? Clean energy becomes cost competitive in a predictable time frame, spurring huge investment in clean energy. Households and businesses have an incredible incentive to go for energy efficiency and conservation in their own lives. Businesses don't need to get a rebate because they are only competing for our dollars um, you know, to the extent they're producing something we want. The money needs to go to the people just, I know it was a big debate last night about where the money should go. I personally feel incredibly strongly that to get the carbon price we need to shift behavior in this economy, we need all the money to go back to the people so that 70% of households are protected. So, and there's our last element, that everyone receives an equal dividend or rebate so they can afford participating in our economy while we transition to clean energy. How will these two programs work together? What's appropriate? And this kind of gets back to our resolution discussion. We um, need to be mindful. I think California has accomplished a lot. The AB32 cap and trade program is, you know, without offsets, would be fine. It's a low tax. There's nothing harmful about it. Some of the money is being spent on good projects. And every state could have a low tax like that without really hurting them. You know, it's not high enough to affect our competition very much with other states. It's not a serious problem. Here I'm showing how CCL's carbon fee price can be added, as a, as a national program, can be added to what's already going on in California. Currently in California, we started in 2012-2013 with a $10 um, tax on the energy sector, and um, the, the law says that the floor shall move up 5% per year plus inflation from the $10 price. Currently, we are above the floor. The floor is a little over $11, and we're at a $12 price per ton CO2e. Um, if in 2015, for instance, that would be very optimistic, we added a $15, an additional federal price of $15 a ton, we should basically say we are not preempting any existing cap-and-trade program. They may continue to run around and do whatever they want. The main impact of this on California would be that they would stay at their floor price because we'd be exerting an additional price that would reduce the demand for pollution. We'll answer questions in a bit. Um, that would reduce the demand for permits to pollute nationwide and create a, a level playing field along with those border adjustments, um, we do not need to worry about the cap-and-trade system. The reason we do need to worry about cap-and-trade is because there are a lot of powerful financial interests that are supporting it. Governor Brown is supporting it. Mary Nichols, the head of our Air Resources Board, is supporting it. They will continue supporting it, and they are pushing it as a global model. If it succeeds as a global model, especially with offsets, as was proposed in the 2009 legislation by Waxman Markey, both good day, good guys, but didn't realize what they were doing, we will have a period where we will lock in additional climate degradation. 
Um, so briefly, what I would say we need to do is um, we need to recognize that cap and tool with offsets is a weaker tool for fixing incentives, but has many powerful interests backing it. We need to be respectful. We need not to preempt it at the state level, but we need to say, because of the urgency of the situation, we definitely need this other federal program on top of it, and the federal program should be the model for what we encourage to happen globally. We need to fight off Wall Street, fight off the fossil fuel interests, fight off everybody who hopes to profit from an in offset incentive, and, and get that done. Carbon fees with dividends is more efficient, it's more fair, it has greater potential to, by rising quickly, as I showed in the prior slide, to fix the incentives that are keeping us addicted to fossil fuels. So uh, my bottom line is AB32's cap and trade program can co coexist with the National Carbon Fee and Dividend Program. I'd like to work with those who are working on resolutions to pass by and to note that, that we will not promote <coughs> cap and trade and that we need this program of fee and dividend nationally to make the difference that's needed here. Thank you. Considerations that we, I think, all need to be aware of with respect to passing fee and dividend. Oh, why is this? <laughs> Don't worry about it. Just right. um, the first is as. Sorry, Lori covered some of this, and I didn't realize she was going to. So if I if I repeat, I will try not to repeat. Um, AB thirty two, the sheer scope of AB thirty two makes California the global leader in climate legislation. And that's something, that means the whole world is looking to California. California, I have read, is the envy of the world with climate legislation. And that includes AB 32. Secondly, Brown is very much involved in this. Uh, he sees AB 32 and decarbonization as his legacy, a big part of his legacy. Uh, he went to Lima, he's going to Paris, he's crafting agreements with other countries and the agreements are to collaborate and share technology and ideas and cap and trade program as part of that. Emissions from, emission reductions from cap and trade are not a success. Cap and trade has provided only 15 to 20% of our emission reductions and this is down from a, a projected 50% when this was implemented. Well, I think why is because of what Lori told you about offsets. Um, the state is not admitting that this isn't a success yet, and it's possible with transportation fuels being included this year that that proportion of emissions reductions might grow, but on the other hand, they may not. And, you know, that offset thing is a big problem. So, regardless of that, however, you have to understand that cap and trade in California is being touted as a success, and many people consider it a success. And the reason for that is because CARB implemented this whole big uh, infrastructure to do these auctions. The auctions are going smoothly. Prices are low, and that's what they wanted, and the reason they wanted that is so it wouldn't make ripples in the economy. And all of that is working quite nicely. So cap and trade is considered a success at this point, and nobody's talking about the emissions. So this is a program that is second in size only to the EU, and that program is regarded as a failure. So that leaves California's program as the only large-scale, economy-wide, 
successful cap and trade program on the planet. And with California being the seventh largest economy, it can just be, it can be used practically anywhere without even any scale up. And point number four, when it gets to the time when Congress is considering climate legislation and federal carbon pricing, the people they're gonna ask to testify in their hearings are the experts who know about carbon pricing. And with California leading the globe, we are the ones they're gonna, the, the, the climate policy makers in the state are the ones they're gonna ask. So I think we need their support to get the dividend passed. I'm afraid without that support, cap and trade will be the default mechanism, pricing mechanism adopted by Congress I think we need to start conversations with these people. I think we need to do it now. I know I'm, I'm going over here. But above all, I think we really have to be careful as an organization when we are talking to these people and when we are writing letters to the editor, if they mention California's program in any way, or if we write editorials, I think we really have to be careful to uh, acknowledge and appreciate the work that California is doing. Because if we don't do that, I think we sound uneducated and we are not following CCL's credo of appreciation and respect. Thank you. Sorry, I'm over.